congratulations um, on the series. I loved every moment of it, every every second of it. Um, first of all, uh, I know you were we were both in Frozen, which I came along to see, like just as it was op opening um, one of the press nights. Um, so I wondered, like, how well did you know each other before you worked together on Fellow Travelers? We <laughs> <laughs> maybe too maybe maybe too well <laughs> you know um Noah feels like um a, a brother to me um honestly and, and we've kind of had that relationship from day one um oddly enough something really horrible happened uh in Denver um when we were doing our out of town tryout for Frozen um I developed a tiny vocal pre-nodule and I had to leave the show on the opening weekend to rest. And Noah had to go on as Kristoff with no rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, James. And so that bothered us immediately. <laughs> yeah. So you saw Frozen and you know how massive that production was. And so like when you're building these things from the ground up, it, it takes a village. I mean, it literally takes a village. And so you become forever connected with these people. And Jelani and I immediately bonded. So when we when we got the call saying that we were going to chemistry read with each other for fellow travelers, we both didn't tell each other on purpose so that we could surprise each other on Zoom. And our our, our chemistry read quickly turned into just a, a kiki, as we'll call yeah. it. And I think we ended up doing our, our acting scene probably once. So our chemistry is real. It happens on screen and off screen. And it was such a joy to work with Jelani for those six months in Canada. Yeah. It's a shame Noah's not pretty, you know what I mean? It's like hard to look at his face. So. <laughs> um, and as I was saying, I loved every moment of this. And it really does feel like an epic. It's the kind of mini series I think my parents used to watch about straight people when, <laughs> when, I, was a, when I was a kid. And I just wondered what it means to um, each of you to be part of such an epic miniseries that centers uh, queer characters and queer history uh, as well. Uh, Jelani, we start with you. This is for me um, revolutionary. I've never in my life um, come across a character like Marcus um, or a character like Frankie. Oh. Um, and so uh, for me to be a part of this, it was uh, not that I, oh, it would be really cool if I got this part. No, I had to get this part. I had to be the vessel um, for the story to honor the men that have come before us um, and who have had incredible sacrifices and who fought incredibly hard for us to have the liberties we have today. Um, and it's important that we go back and revisit that history because if you look at what's happening outside right now in America, you kind of wonder, have you seen fellow travelers? Have you seen where we have come from and why, why would you ever want to uh, go back to that, um, go back to living in secrecy and, and hiding. And um, for me, I feel like revealing the inner heart, um, the inner spirit of these men through this miniseries is a revolution. Yeah, I mean, how about you? Yeah, James, you know, I find it so interesting what you said. It was like, you know, your parents, they had these epic love stories and, you know, these prestigious shows that that showed the arc of, of straight characters. And so when I was growing up, I I always searched for myself on television and in, and in film. It's something that I've always wanted to do. And, and I'm telling you now, I came up short. And so to be given this opportunity to kind of highlight the Black queer experience from multiple perspectives and let Marcus and Frankie have an arc, you know, let them fall in love, fall out of love, go through 30 years, 38 years of, of history. It's an incredible gift. And I hope that the younger generation sees their history and knows how we got here today, because it's something that's been erased from, from queer culture, from American history in general. And I think this show does a beautiful job of showcasing the history and also showing us where we can go from here. Yeah. And um, what did you make of the way that the, the series uh, deals with the intersection of Blackness and queerness? Because I, I felt like it did it with... Um, with a lot of thought and nuance. Um, but I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Uh, Jelani, do you want to start again? Yeah, of course. Um, I think I had never seen this kind of exploration of that intersection before. Um, I think uh, there was a really nice collaboration with our showrunner and uh, executive producer, Ron Neiswiner, um, uh, in terms of wanting to take bits of pieces of our personal experiences and infuse Marcus and Frankie with that to make it even more of a, of a nuanced, richer storyteller. Um, and I, I really respect that. Um, I know oftentimes, you know, 
you know, writers uh, come to something being like, this is how I see it. But Rom was really open to our perspective as well. And I think the characters are that much better for that. Um, uh, I, I, I had a great time um, trying to infuse moments of toxicity inside of Marcus. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was important to kind of show as much as no character in Fellow Travelers is uh, necessarily quote unquote good. No one really is like, you know, um, absolutely just, absolutely right. And we love to kind of portray um, uh, black characters in these spaces um, as that. Um, and I so appreciated the chance to be messy, to mm -hmm. show, to show um, how you can make mistakes um, and still be at the intersection of being black and queer. Um, and, and the stakes of the world at that intersection. Um, I think that we're really able to capture that. Yeah. And Noah, how about for you? You know, for me, I'd say one of the things that I appreciated the most was having multiple experiences of the Black gay experience on screen. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you feel lucky if you, if you get one, you know, if you get a Black character or, or a queer character, and to have two of them and be very different, I think is such a gift. And I, I hope that it inspires you know, TV and film to move in that direction. And one of the things I love the most was that you see so much self-hatred in, in queer media and, and, and in TV. And I love that Frankie loves himself. I love that he strives to be authentic. I love that he steps out of the box, whether it be hard or not. And to have that experience depicted on screen and to have the nuances of a hyper-masculine relationship with, you know, a guy who loves to be androgynous and feminist, I think it's a beautiful intersection that exists in real life and that we should develop even more as we as we move into the future. So it was an incredible gift and I, I hope that people see themselves in all the characters. And I love the scenes in the cozy corner. It's such a beautiful set. I mean, it, look, it looks like it from um, how we see it on screen and really beautifully photographed as well. But uh, what was it like doing the, uh, the drag performance scenes uh, with um, Chelsea who plays uh, Storm as well? Oh, yeah, oh my God, it was amazing. You know, like, you know, Stormy's a, a true historical gay icon. So if you don't know her, you know, look, look her up. But you know the drag was was really wonderful because it's a it's a completely different era to what we know as as RuPaul's Drag Race or mainstream drag, and so it's this era of 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 class and sophistication. And so bringing that to life with the candle the candlelight and the the cigarettes and the smooth jazz was su mm -hmm. super super fun. You know I had to practice in those heels, James. I'm not gonna lie, not gonna lie, walking down steps in those chunky heels. Whew. But, you know, we made it through and it was all worth it in the end. <laughs> um, and particularly, yeah, particularly uh, in the Santa Baby scene, um, I think it was so amazing to feel the Black audience inside that being just like blackity, blackity, black, 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 black. It was just like, these black men are here to enjoy themselves, to unravel, to just be like, throw up their hands and and, and, and cheer and holler. Um, and to be inside that room with that energy that day, it was so inspiring. And I, it's one of my favorite memories from set. Oh yeah. And one of the most um, powerful moments for me that sort of broke me in, in, the, in the best way watching this, um, with one of your scenes, uh, Jelani, with um, when Marcus is comforting a sort of, uh, it's a, a young gay man who tells him that he's HIV positive mm. and he just says, you're innocent to him mm. over, over, over and over again. It's, you know, on the page, it's kind of simple, but yeah. as I say, it's incredibly powerful. Would you be able to just talk about, um, you yeah, know, putting that scene together, being in that scene? So I, uh, I got a call from Matt Bomer, um, who's also an executive producer on this project. And he said, have you read episode eight yet? And I said, no. He's like, I think you should open up your email and read it. Um, and I was like, what, what, what could I read? What, what, what's, what, is, what is it? And I first read the scene and my body said, I, I, I don't know if I can accomplish that. I, I don't know um, if that is actually quite doable to, to give, that is a huge responsibility. Um, and 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 I called him back and he said, he said, you know, I think you you can find your way through this. Um, and I'm so honored to have been the vessel of strength for a character like Jerome, who is HIV positive and reveals that information. And all he wants to hear is you are innocent. You 
are not the issue. You are made of love. You are made of goodness. You are made of all the beautiful things that God has put on this earth. Um, and, and to hold black man to black man, to literally hold him in that moment, um, for me felt uh, like I was hugging every man who has ever died from this disease who wanted to receive that hug. Um, mm. And I was incredibly honored to do that scene. It was incredibly difficult. Um, it was a long night of of finding trust um, in uh, Jerome. Uh, it's eyes Jude who plays Jerome. Jude plays nice. him brilliantly. Um, you know, I went over to him and I said, "We're going to find the scene here, eye to eye, you and me. Nobody else here exists. Um, forget the pressure of what this is. Just let's have the human moment." And I think that came through on the screen. Yeah, it does beautifully. Yeah. I'm I'm glad we got to talk about it, but now I'm so <laughs> I know. I'm like it, emotional it, all over again. I'm like, wait, wait, we got to get it, it. It really, you know, it it really touches me every time I think about it that I that that it exists now in the world as as something people can have forever. Yeah, and you mentioned um, Matt Bomer, and of course, there's Jonathan Bailey too. And I feel like you know sometimes when you work uh, with the cast, I'm sure it feels like. And they're their colleagues, but perhaps doesn't go much beyond that. But um, from when I've seen you interact in some of the other interviews you, you've done together, it feels like it's a fellow travelers kind of like chosen family. And I wondered what it um, whether I was right thinking that, and also how significant it felt that you, you know for queer actors playing these queer characters too. Yeah, I I would say like you're totally right. Like you know, it's very rare that you get on a set and you just love everyone. You know, you know, but we all kind of were on a mission together to, to bring this entire story and to bring the truth and to honor this experience together. And I think that is what brought us together as a, as a family, as a, as a fellow travelers family. And I can honestly say that, that we love each other very deeply. Jelani will tell you about our, our group chat and our group messages. <laughs> oh, but, you know, and- Don't honestly, bring that up. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, I think that's, that is why you're able to do those deep emotional scenes is because you look into that person's eyes and you trust them. And mm -hmm. we trust each other because we all have deep love and respect for each other. And now when they said cut, yeah, we were dancing and acting a fool, but you know, we can only do that because we honor each other's experience and we were all on the same mission together. So you're absolutely right about that. And how rare to have four people who actually love who they are. Yeah. Who actually love everything about them represent these four characters on screen. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm of the of the world of the best actor for the part, but I believe that they found the best actors to play these parts who also happen to be queer people, who also happen to love the fact that they are such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd love to get from each of you your favorite piece of LGBTQ plus culture. So it could be a film, a book, a TV series, theater, music, art, any piece of culture or a person who identifies as LGBTQ plus. So um, someone or something that's had an impact on you and resonated with you over the years uh, and why. <laughs> so oddly enough, right before um, I did Fellow Travelers, um, I actually was voiced two audiobooks. Um, one um, for um, uh, a book called My Government Means to Kill Me by Rashid Newsom, which was one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And if you uh, want an insight into a Black queer young man's experience as an AIDS activist in the 80s, it's a fantastic read. Um, and then I also got to do um, the audiobook for a book called Boys Come First by Aaron Foley, which is hopefully being made into an Amazon series pretty soon. Um, and uh, it is the first time I felt uh, my contemporary experience as a Black queer body really fleshed out in a fun, uh, hilarious, and um, heartfelt way. And so to have now the gifts of 2022 being these three amazing pieces of art, I am just like, so um full after being so starved for so much of my life and i'm gonna shout out uh one of my favorite drag queens of all time uh bob the drag queen Ooh. and yeah and because you know like i remember when i moved to new york city i would i would leave my broadway show on a wednesday and i would rush to get to bob's show 
because of his comedic skills, but also his truth telling. And the show that he helped bring to HBO, We're Here, where they, they go into these small towns and they, they bring their queerness and their full selves and their authenticity. And you see these, these beautiful backstories of pain and desperation, but also just wanting to be themselves. I mean, I'm so happy that he brought that to the mainstream and used his platform for good. So my shout out is, is to wonderful Bobby directly. Yeah. And speaking of emotional shows, that's another one that gets me. <laughs> when it got to the second series, I, like, I don't think I'm going to cry this time, but like every episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's because you see yourself reflected in, in all of these people, you know, what, no matter if you're an out and proud gay man and love yourself now, you know, we were all once those people. And, and so it's beautiful to see depicted on screen. And you're both so stylish. I'm lo loving your um, Instagrams at the moment, all the photo shoots you've been doing. Um, so when it came to, um, fellow travelers, the costumes are exquisite, but I love the fact that they don't sort of draw focus or, you know, away from the emotional pull of the series, but they are very eye-catching. So did you each have a favorite uh, look or style era? Uh, Baby, in the series? We got a shout out our costume designer. Okay, Joseph Lacourt. okay, baby. This man is extraordinary uh -huh. in that he was able to bring four decades of fashion onto the screen have them all mean something for every character and still somehow not distract or take away. I mean, it really, he did a brilliant job. Um, my favorite, of course, was the 70s. <laughs> the 70s with the leather jacket, feeling badass, um, looking sexy with a big Afro. I mean, I just really thought the 70s, um, and also our pop of color came in the 70s as well. So that was for me, my favorite. Um, my favorite, my favorite decade to live in was the 50s because, you know, my drag looks in the 50s, I had these big bell skirts. And then one specifically was my drag look for Santa Baby. And Joseph and I worked together to make this beautiful Eartha Kitt inspired look. And although it was a little uncomfortable to wear my corset and my tights and my high heels, it was worth every second because I felt so powerful in that red, you know, to be to be up there seducing wonderful Marcus slash Jelani in that beautiful red outfit and that gorgeous wig, it, it was iconic. So I would say my Santa baby look for sure. Well, Noah Jelani, baby. thanks so much. <laughs> oh, and you had a topic. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, nobody's look better in a Santa suit. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> no, you, yeah, you've set the bar high this Christmas season. Set the season. bar very yeah. high. Okay. Maybe Cheryl Lee Ralph has Miss Claus this year. Maybe that, maybe that, that, that comes close. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much yes james wonderful to meet you nice to meet you guys too